Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this last Sunday of August. We are always happy to see your smiling faces here in worship. And we hope that this will be um, a time that will enrich your faith as we worship together. If you can smell that great Italian beef waf wafting up from the fellowship hall, um, you don't want to miss this. After church today, um, Carol and Sean have put together a nice uh, fellowship time for us today. So please stay and grab a bite to eat. Um, also, if you need to grab something and go, I, I'm sure we can accommodate that as well. So we thank Carol, Carol and Sean for doing that on our behalf. Next week, we will be worshiping outdoors. We expect this to be our final Sunday of outdoor worship, but you never really know <laughs> with COVID. So um, plan to join us next week if you can. Bring a lawn chair. Uh, uh, if you can't bring a chair, then we'll find one for you. And we will also have refreshments um, at that time as well. Um, we have a couple other announcements. I guess first, I, I simply want to call your attention to the fact that um, through the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, of which we are part, there are opportunities for uh, all of us to participate in um, refugee efforts, um, welcoming people from Afghanistan, some of whom will be coming to the Chicago area, and the needs will be great. Um, so I do have information from Bishop Jeff Clements on ways in which we can help, and of course, with what has been happening in Haiti, and what we predict is going to happen in the next day or so um, in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, the, the needs will also be great there. And uh, uh, Lutheran Disaster Services provides ways that we can help in that respect. So please let me know, and I'll put this in our uh, September newsletter as well, Please uh, let us know if you are looking for avenues to help um, the great needs in our world right now. Um, I'm going to ask John Boltz to come up and make an announcement about a new monthly program that we're hoping to implement, um, but it's going to take your help. And it's going to take the help of our children um, as we get started back up in Sunday school. Terry gets me to come up here. He says I'm not loud enough, so I, I think I'm pretty loud. <laughs> you would scream from back there, it'd be fine. <laughs> anyway, uh, at the council uh, at last couple months, uh, Pastor brought up a thing called a noisy offering. What we're going to do is uh, get some tin buckets and ask our children to walk around with the buckets and everybody empty their pockets of their spare change. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of times I don't have a lot of spare change in my pocket, but I bring I bring home spare change and I, you know, everybody's got a tray or a cup or a bottle or something that they always put their change in. And we're just asking you to, to bring that, bottle it up or bag it up or whatever, and we're going to drop it in this bucket and we're going to make some noise with that offering. And, and every month we'll designate uh, a specific place for it to go. And we'll we'll post that. 
but uh, it'll be kind of fun for the kids and try to get them involved and, and uh, make some noise. So keep a hold of that. Keep a hold of that, change, and don't forget it on Sunday. If you're like me, or like Jane, Jane, we were just talking this morning. We gotta write stuff down anymore. <laughs> so put put a post-it on the refrigerator or something or on the door where you're walking out on Sunday and, and don't forget your change. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And um, I would also mention that our first noisy offering will go towards the crop walk on September 19th. So in worship that day, we'll be emptying our pockets of change. And if you're like me, it goes in the cup holder in my car. Um, Jane, is there anything you would like to say about the crop walk at this time? No, there's uh, still sign-up sheets back there if you want to walk. And if you don't want to walk but want to sponsor people, we've left them out on the table. Thanks, Jane. Um, Jane has done a wonderful job of getting this organized for us. I should also mention that uh, there is abundant produce coming from people's gardens, and uh, you'll find some uh, produce to take home with you today, and uh, as well as um, uh, up here at the, at, in the North X, as well as in the Fellowship <coughs> Hall. So don't hold back. Jane has a lot of tomatoes for us to take home. And Louise brought lots of peppers. Ah, great. Okay. So let's enjoy this abundance uh, at the end of the summer, if, if we will. As most of you know, I suspect um, we do have another mask mandate coming about in the state of Illinois, um, which I believe takes effect tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So we will again provide masks out in the narthex for anyone who does not have one at the ready. We'll have hand sanitizer available too. And uh, again, we'll just simply remind each other of um, social distancing practices as we go um, into this next wave of the pandemic. And hopefully this will be the last. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation today? Okay, if not, I will invite you to stand as you are able for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's continue our worship with the singing of our gathering song, number 772, Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways. Let us pray. Oh God, our strength, without you, we are weak and wayward creatures. 
Protect us from all danger that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and we will invite Steve Moyer to come up and share our lessons today. This morning's first reading on this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from Deuteronomy. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live and enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the people, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people, for what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? What other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Word of God, word of life. Amen. <laughs> Let us now read responsibly from the 15th Psalm. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill. Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They, will, they do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor the those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health and do not fear their <laughs> They do not give money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall ne never be overthrown. Our second reading is taken from James. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome the meekness, the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. They look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongue, but deceive their hearts, <clears throat> A religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Word of God, word of life. The Holy 
Gospel according to St. Mark, the se seventh chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is written, for it is written from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. <coughs> So the key question in our gospel for today is very obvious. Where does evil come from? And it's a very timely question, isn't it? Because this past week, we got a close-up view of evil with the suicide bombing in Kabul, Afghanistan, and the events which followed it. Some people claim that Islam is a violent religion, but having studied that religion in seminary and knowing several Muslims quite well, I just don't buy that. In fact, Islam is at its core a peaceful religion. Though, Islamic extremis, extremism can be very violent and evil, just as I believe any other extremism in the world, in a world religion, can be likewise. We saw an offshoot of Islamic extremism in action by ISIS-K last week at the Afghanistan airport, and it was devastating. We know that there still may be more to come. American reactions to this event ranged from shock to grief to rage and everything in between and beyond. What fuels extremist movements like these? Some of you know this better than I do because you've seen war up close and personal. My one word answer to that question, what fuels extremist movements, is hate. Although I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. And where does this hatred come from but the heart? Jesus nails it in our gospel lesson for today. And if we don't think Christians are capable of such hatred, we have only to look to the past for examples. About a thousand years ago, for example, the bloody crusades or religious wars between 1095 and 1291 
were aimed at taking back the city of Jerusalem from Muslim rule. More recently, some, and I emphasize some, of those who carried out the attack on our capital last January were members of white nationalist extremist groups that identify as Christian. For some, their white national identity led them to destroy, threaten, injure, and do grave psychological damage to the Washington, D.C. Police Department, leading to at least four suicides that we know of at this time. Yes, hatred is evil, and when harbored in our hearts, it can lead to unspeakable acts. The first time I stared evil in the eye was at the scene of a campus shooting, which took the lives of st six students in 2008. When I viewed that horrible carnage, I felt like I was looking at the devil himself. And if this has happened to me, I'm sure that others in our congregation have had a similar experience of seeing the face of evil. Well, in today's gospel, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and scribes and us about the difference between external and internal matters and where evil begins. For so many centuries, God's people, the Israelites, had lived by the commandments given to Moses so that they would be God's people and he would be their God. And this is what's called a covenant relationship. God was always faithful to the covenant, but as we know, the people often strayed and had to be reminded of their part of, their bar of the bargain over and over again. By the time Jesus came on the scene, the Jewish leaders had added over 610 additional rules and customs over the years to their list of commandments. Obeying these laws must have been incredibly challenging and I wouldn't be surprised if the Jews of Jesus' day didn't even know most of them. But that's what the scribes and Pharisees were there for, to make sure the rules were followed, whether they made sense or not, whether they were important or not. As we see in our Gospel text today, Many of these rules that the Jews followed were meant to separate what is clean from what is unclean or impure. Now, how many of us will always wash our hands or use hand sanitizer before we eat? Yeah, we got a few folks got a few folks and how important do you think this is 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 it very important is it yeah it's fine if I get around to it or if is it I never even think about it let me run through those again very very important okay um, it's fine if I get around to it, but if not, it's no big deal. It's probably where I would fall in. And I never even think about it. Okay, so we've got a fairly, uh, a fairly clean bunch, fairly hygienic <laughs> bunch here today. And there's no right or right answer, or wrong answer to that. The poll is just to show that we all have different differences along that spectrum. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus eventually comes along to challenge some of these laws, and it gets him in trouble, big trouble. 
He and his followers are accused of disrupting the traditions of the elders, especially regarding hand washing before meals. We learned that the big deal was not so much having clean hands before eating as it was about not following the ancient practice of their faith and the holiness tradition of washing before eating. To disregard the practices that help cleanse daily life was to dismantle the faith and disregard the tradition that had mediated the faith. As Raquel Lepsum, an African-American theologian, puts it, Jews could uphold God's requirements for holiness by ordering life in such a way that all they did and touched was sanctified or made holy. This required avoiding everything that defiled a person. But Jesus saw it differently, according to Mark. Jesus critiqued this Jewish tradition by quoting from scripture, specifically from um, the book of Isaiah, 29th chapter and the 13th verse. Here he used the word of the prophet Isaiah to argue against the Pharisees' practices. He tells them that they are to um, that, that they, by following practices to the letter, um, are hypocritical and that they go against the true worship of God. Jesus maintained that the Jews need not feel obligated to follow the Pharisees or feel excluded by them if they didn't follow exactly the same practices such as circumcision and avoiding certain foods. In addition, the Gentiles in Mark's community can do the same, which opens up a path for others who aren't Jewish to sign on to Jesus' kingdom agenda. This is revolutionary at the start of the Christian church, but it was seen by the Pharisees and scribes as heresy. And then Jesus teaches that an understanding of defilement in terms of God's kingdom is not about what goes into a person, but about what comes out of the person. He says that how or even what a person eats does not defile. Whether the hands or the food are considered clean or unclean are, is not what matters. These things no longer have the power to deny a person's relationship with God or to prevent someone from participating among the people of God in the church. When you think about that for a while, it's really quite a paradigm shift. Let me quote the Reverend Letsam again. She writes, in almost every religious tradition, there is a belief that certain things or people have the power to defile individuals or a community. There are usually two basic approaches to dealing with the pollutant, washing machines or garbage disposal. At the heart of the washing machine approach, is the conviction that the power to cleanse is greater than the power to contaminate. Therefore, the polluted thing or person can be cleaned up and restored to inclusion in the community. When one opts for the garbage disposal approach, there's a belief that the power to contaminate is greater than the power to cleanse. Consequently, the pollutant must be removed before it corrupts another individual or the community as a whole. So I wonder, what are the pollutants that we fear as we practice our faith in 2021? Well, I can offer a few, and I'm sure that 
you can add more. My list of, of things that I, I worry might pollute are online uh, pornography, which is an abuse of God's gift of love. I also think that abuse of other humans and animals in as many forms um, violates God's command to care for other humans and the rest of God's creation. A third one that I'll add is slander or gossip against another person, which is an obvious violation of the Eighth Commandment to support our neighbors in every way possible. So, you know, there, those are three of mine on my list. Mark offers a pretty good list in our gospel, too, saying that all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So do we take the washing machine approach or the, uh, the garbage disposal approach to our list of evils? According to Mark, Jesus redefines what defiles a person and pronounces all food to be clean. And in doing so, he eradicates the need to use either the, gar the garbage disposal or the washing machine approach to cleansing because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus desires us to be pure and clean in our interactions with the world, and I think especially so in our human relationships. Above all, though, he wants us to have a right relationship with our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' diatribe against the scribes and the Pharisees in today's Gospel, Jesus recalls the words of the prophet Isaiah in saying that, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Revealing that the people worship in vain, and they teach human precepts as doctrine. God desires us to worship him in all truth and purity, and not just go through the motions. Jesus also harkens back to the prophet Jeremiah when he says, I will put my law into their hearts. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Living by the word of God is a matter of the heart that is forgiven, renewed, and transformed by God's grace. This is a matter of life and death. Life and death are at stake in Jesus' mission, which we'll hear more about this fall as we continue our journey through Mark's Gospel. By challenging the ancient external traditions of Judaism, Jesus does, of course, incur the wrath of the scribes and Pharisees, and he will pay the ultimate price on the cross. I want to suggest that this coming week, we, all of us and each of us, strive to have clean hearts. I don't think that will be very easy. At least I don't think it will be all that easy for me. When I was little, before the age of six, my dad taught my sister and me a children's prayer in German. I don't know if any of you know it, but I know we have um, quite a, few, a bit of German ancestry in our congregation here. So if you have a better grasp of German than I do, please go easy on me. I'm, I'm uh, not proficient in German, and um, you'll have to overlook my poor pronunciation. But it goes something like this. Ich bin klein, mein Herz ist rein, darf niemand drin wohnen als Jesus allein. Amen. 
Here's the rough translation into English. I am little, my heart is clean. No one can live in it except Jesus alone. Amen. I love this prayer for its simplicity and the pure words that come from a clean heart. And I think what I'm going to do this week is resurrect this bedtime prayer again as it reminds me of the need for Jesus to live within me so that what comes out of me will be clean and pure. Perhaps you, too, have a prayer or a saying or a song that reminds you of your early days of learning about Jesus. If so, hey, let's talk about that over Italian beef sandwiches in a few minutes. Often on Sundays in worship, we pray that God will create in us clean hearts. Perhaps that's why we often feel cleansed when we leave worship. We have a clean slate for the start of the coming week. Having confessed our sins and gathered for Holy Communion, we have the strength and the will to be to live anew again according to Jesus' kingdom values. In Jesus' transformative name, amen. We continue our worship by singing our hymn of the day, which is number 806, O God, my faithful God. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue um, with our prayers of intercession, the response uh, after each petition, I will say, uh, Lord, in your mercy, you will respond, hear our prayer. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of promise, Transform our hearts that we may hear and understand what it means to live, not by external rights, but by your word of prophet, promise, which gives life and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church that it is a safe haven for all who seek your presence. Fill it with pastors, deacons, and leaders who echo your expansive and generous welcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole of creation, that plants and animals have the habitat and resources to thrive and flourish. Inspire us to protect threatened habitats and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for individuals in positions of authority, including military leaders at home and abroad. Raise up wise and discerning leaders in federal, state, and local governments and guide them to seek the welfare of every person. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who are in need, especially those in Haiti. 
and on the Gulf Coast. Support and encourage those who are unemployed, underemployed, or experiencing poverty. Bring food, shelter, clothes, and stability for daily life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation, especially those beginning a new school year. Empower teachers and school administrators, guide students in their learning and development. Accompany parents, foster parents, and caregivers who provide encouragement and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed who showed us how to honor God, how to honor God with our heart. Especially we pray for Cassie Martin, the family of Cassie Martin, who have just lost her in a tragic accident. We also pray, Lord, for those who have served their country with valor, who have lost their lives this week. Give comfort and peace to all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share that peace with one another in a safe way. As we move into the meal part of our liturgy, I want to remind you that um, we will commune today by intinction. Um, I, I believe Steve Moyer is on to assist today. Okay. And uh, I will be offering you the bread as you come forward up the center aisle. Um, you will receive it in your hand and then proceed to where Steve is standing. Um, so that you can um, dip the bread into the wine or the grape juice as you so choose. Also, I'll remind you that there are the communion cups that are outside in the narthex, in the narthex. and uh, if you would prefer, um, I bet we can get John Bolts to bring you one of those communion cups. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table before your, with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body and blood for the life of the world. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together the words that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Please stand as you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Jesus, bread of life, you we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. And now may the blessing of God who provides us and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen.